Right, at the recording start uh, starting to record now. But the first um, first thing on the agenda is uh, Ray is going to talk about his uh, book, uh, Urban Ubon, The Last Camp Before Freedom. So I'll uh, pass it over to, Je uh, to Ray. Okay, I'll just. If people don't know already, this is the book. Oh, Barbara's arrived. Hello, Barbara. <laughs> Your microphone's on, Barbara. That's it. Thank you. Is that better? It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning, everybody. Some <laughs> new faces. That's lovely. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Kevin, I'll, I'll kick off now. Yeah, um, the, uh, Barbara Ray is just going to start talking about his book for the uh, book draw lovely. this month. Okay, okay. Ray. Uh, I think I should just start by saying that um, my father was uh, not a, a FIPO. He was uh, a soldier in the Black Watch Regiment and um, he his, his war was in Europe. So... Um, I've spent a lot of time before he passed away uh, about three years ago um, finding out about his military history, um, D-Day landings and uh, a push through France, Belgium, Battle of the Bulge, crossing the Rhine into Germany. And um, it kind of inspired me really to find out more about the war. And I didn't know much about uh, the pattern of the war in the Far East. But uh, my, my wife of uh, 12 years now is um, living in Thailand in a place called Ubon. And um, I went over there, uh, uh, it's nearly six That's years ago now, six, six years come this January. And we had a road trip yeah. from, from Ubon. And Ubon is in the northeast of Thailand. So um, those of you who can... Season. Those of you who can uh, imagine Thailand, you've got Bangkok in, in, in the middle, and maybe you know Chiang Mai, which is directly north. Well, Ubon is northeast, about 400 miles from, uh, from Bangkok. So it's a, it's a fair way, but we decided to do a road trip, and um, we went to Kanchanaburi, and in the cemetery there, there was um, a gravestone. Um, belonging to an Australian soldier with a very similar sounding surname to mine. And my surname is with Nall, N A L, -L and he was with Nell, N E L, -L. And I, you know, you, you sort of look at this and go, woo, uh, I wonder. And I decided to find out about the Thai Burma Railway through his eyes. Um, you know, what was his war? All I had to go on was the gravestone, you, you know, you're familiar with, with his regiment and, uh, and number. And um, we progressed through Kanchanaburi, through Hellfire Pass, up to Three Pagodas Pass, and I just got into it. And um, started researching um, Sergeant Arthur Horace Withnell, and got a long way. I, I eventually, um, I contacted his family and got a lot of his history. He died at Hellfire Pass um, of cholera. He had a brother um, who was with him at uh, Hellfire Pass, but um, he was transported on to Japan. I think somebody, there's a bit of feedback there. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, I got we got back to Ubon, and I'm researching Sergeant Arthur and getting you know quite excited and and I joined the Facebook group of the researching far people history group, uh, the one Meg Parks uh, is is famous for. And um, in one of their postings, there was a reference to a place called Ubol, U B O L, and it prick me up a little bit because um, sometimes Ubon, U-B-O-N, is written down as Ubol. So I asked my wife, well, did you know if there's a Japanese prisoner of war camp in Ubon? And she said, I don't, I don't know, I don't think so. The, the only thing we could refer to was um, a monument in the middle of Ubon, which they called the Monument of Merit. 
and when you go there there's a, a plaque in in english that explains that there was um prisoners of war japanese prisoners of war from uh, 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 to build um an airstrip and um, this monument was provided by the um people of uh, the prisoners for the people of ubon as a thank you for their hospitality and, and kindness that they gave to the prisoners and that's all we had but it was intriguing and um, decided to um, find out a little bit more and gradually and uh, the story came together um, you know the wonders of the internet um, it, it's fantastic really and just gathered little bits of information here and there about um, you know who, who was um, how the prisons got there and, and the story but one one of the big breakthroughs was um, a book by Major David Smiley who was the British Special Operations Executive Officer who liberated the camp and in his biography he gives a lot of information about uh, about the Ubon camp from which I was able to build and um, he gave a rough location of the camp, which, you know, was, was quite important, really. But looking on Google Maps, I couldn't quite figure out where it was. He said it was nine kilometres north on the road to Yasathon. Well, today that's the road 212, and on Google Maps you can follow it. But where was the nine kilometres beginning? <laughs> I couldn't quite work that out. And... Um, you know, I thought it must be quite close to Ubon, but couldn't quite get there. And then by by chance, I also found out that um, Maurice Naylor, who sadly passed away, um, I think it was the 30th of September, um, I was talking to him on the telephone and I had Google Maps open on my computer. And he was, um, he, he was giving me a few more clues and, and I, I actually found the airstrip whilst talking to uh, Morris and um, so then you know had had a, a real piece of um, information to get hold of and uh, next time I was in Ubon um, with with the Google map we got in the car and uh, a friend of mine was over from the UK as well and uh, with my wife the the, uh, the three of us set off to try and find this uh, this airstrip and um, Roughly on the main road, we we thought, well, this must be it. We'll turn off and try and follow some of these uh, little grassy tracks to try and find the airstrip. And we went down this one track and we were getting deeper and deeper into overgrown. Um, it's not jungle, but it was overgrown. And um, we decided to turn round. And at the beginning of this road was a school. So uh, I asked my wife if she would go and ask at the school um, the directions to uh, the airstrip and um, she asked one of the teachers and he said um, I can do better than that he said speak to that lady over there and this lady was just getting on a motorbike to go home and um, she knew where the airstrip was but what was even better was her father um, was the um, a leader of the village in which the airstrip was um, was, was uh, built and um, she said he'll be delighted to talk to you just follow me so we followed her on the motorbike and we went back to uh, this, this village and um, uh, her, her father was uh, attending a funeral at the time but he came out of the funeral to see us and he, he, he only a very small man but his name was Tong D and um, he was a, a small boy about 11 or 12 years old when the uh, Japanese and the prisoners were were in the village and he took us to the airstrip and uh, that was one of the sort of big moments of the research we actually were standing on the airstrip built by the uh, the prisoners and um, through my book with Major Smiley he, he gave a few bits of information as well which um, I knew about but uh, also Tong Di knew about but he didn't have any prompting from me he was saying well 
I can show you where the camp is, uh, about a mile away from the airstrip, and he took us there. And um, he took us to um, a burial ground for nearly 1,200 horses, um, which uh, Major Smiley writes about uh, in his autobiography. And there we were in the, you know, in, in the burial ground. So that, that was really a big step forward, you know, to, to in, the, in the research. And um, then over the years, I've um, been to Kew and dug out documents. Um, one early excellent find was the medical diary for Ubon. Um, the, the Ubon camp, for those who don't know, was only open for six months. It, it, it opened in February 1945 and, of course, liberated in August. So it was, it was very short-lived, really. But this medical diary covers the whole period. And um, I've analysed that um, a lot, you know, into different complaints and um, all uh, lengths of stay in the hospital and blah, blah, blah. So if anybody's interested in that, I can provide information um, later. But, um, uh, yeah, with, with the medical diary and then other documents at Q, just giving little snippets of information here and there. But in gathering it all together, the, the picture began to develop of... Um, of, of the camp. Um, Smiley's um, uh, report on the operation was is uh, available at, uh, at Kew. That gives an awful lot of information about positions of Japanese um, soldiers, um, etc. And uh, um, he, he, he was out there to help the Saritai, which again then developed into another string of this research. Um, the Seritai helped him to um, liberate the camp. Um, he, he was sent out there in uh, May. Yeah, he arrived in May 1945, so a little bit late. But um, his job was to train the Seritai in uh, sabotage and intelligence gathering and, um, uh, and the use of firearms. But uh, they didn't get the supply of firearms that they, that they would have wanted, so it was... A little bit uh, short but nevertheless um they were ready to fight the japanese and that opened up another little story to say well you know what was going on there they were getting ready to fight the japanese well they, there was plans by mountbatten to um do a d-day type um attack on japanese positions and the seritai would have been used as um internal forces in Thailand um, on, on that occasion. But of course it never happened, so it, it was um, it was dropped. But my interest then developed in the Seritai. You know, what, what part did they have to play in Thailand's uh, World War II history? So, you know, starting with Ubon, I, I kind of found the end of the story and was going backwards to find the beginning. And uh, uh, the, the Seritai movement was... Um, founded by a Thai politician called uh, Luang Pridi, who, um, who was um, finance minister at the time the Japanese um, occupied. Well, I, I avoid the word invaded because it wasn't an invasion as such, um, the Japanese. It was, um, they, and, and again, this is how the story develops into the political side of, of um, of Thailand now, um, I was very interested in, you know, how did Thailand, as a, as a before the war, they were considered an ally of uh, Britain and America, you know, how, how come they got involved with the Japanese? And so that, that was another thread to the Ubon story, you know, going backwards to um, December 1941. Um, and uh, pretty, uh, after, after the Japanese were allowed to um, used Thailand as a staging post to go down to Malaya and obviously onto Singapore and, and, and also into Burma. Um, he, he was really dead against this. He, he didn't like the Japanese and hated that decision. So uh, almost on the same day as the Japanese arrived in, in Thailand, he formed the Seritai as a resistance movement. Um, but it was very, very slow to kick off because communications with um, the outside world were, were now difficult because Britain and America were um, busy 
you know, doing their own thing and treated Thailand as um, as as an enemy. And especially then when Thailand declared war on Great Britain and um, America, and but the Americans didn't accept it. So you go back to those reasons. What happened there? Why why did Britain accept the declaration of war, and why did the Americans not? And that that, that was an interesting story. A little um, by story there is that the popular belief is that um, the Americans sent the uh, sorry the Thai sent the sent to the Americans the declaration of war to their ambassador, a chap called Seni Pramor. And um, he failed to deliver the declaration of war to um, uh, to the Americans. And the popular story is that he, he kept the declaration in his pocket. But um, I've been researching this a little, in a bit more detail, and I, I, do, I do believe he, he never actually received the declaration of war because before then he made it well known that he didn't accept Thailand's decision to let the Japanese in. So why would he receive a paper of Thailand declaring war on America and deliver that to the Americans if he if he didn't believe them, you know, he'd lost faith in his in his government, and uh, the Americans didn't accept it anyway because they recognised that the will of the Thai people was uh, was against the Japanese and not um, and not for them. So that that was another reason, um, and the British, well, they accepted it. Um, because of course they were they felt very violated uh, the Thais had let the Japanese into uh, Thailand and hence Malaya you know fighting down towards uh, Singapore and, and north towards Burma so why wouldn't they act, not accept um, a declaration of war you know we we were very upset <laughs> um, and also a bit later on there was uh, the, the, the the Japanese um, gave back some of the land that uh, uh, Thailand had lost to uh, the British in Burma. Um, so, you know, there were some good reasons why the British um, were, were not very happy. And that, that and those decisions from the Americans and the British um, filtered through. So, a couple of years later, when the Seritai in Thailand actually made contact with the Allies, Britain and America, that um, the British were saying, "Well, we, how can we help an enemy? Because <laughs> you know we were at war with Thailand, so why would we help them to beat the Japanese? You know, th there was a lot of toing and froing and, and um, resentment, uh, reticence of the British Parliament." But the Americans didn't have these problems, so through the um, OSS, they were much more prepared to help the Seritai. And I think um, eventually the, the, the British um, Special Operations Executive, you know, this argument between the military and the politicians um, developed, and um, eventually the, the SOE uh, won the day, so the British then uh, were allowed to, to go in. And that's, that's where Smiley comes in. Um, so that um, small story of um, you know a, a, a posting on Facebook, <laughs> misspelling the name of Ubon, but um, you know because I, I happened to be there and I knew that Ubon was sometimes called uh, Ubol, um, opened up this treasure chest of um, of, uh, of research for me, which. Uh, uh, I, I just got into and couldn't let go, um, and and again, in being in um, a, a great position of being able to research in the UK, going down to Kew and the IWM and and so on, and being in Facebook groups with people like yourselves around and um, you know to to help and guide and whatnot, but also actually being a regular visitor to Ubon because I go two or three times a year. And um, the thing about Thailand is that um, they know what you've had for breakfast before you get out of bed. And um, word got around that there was this uh, farang, which is the Thai word for foreigner, 
was um, sniffing around Ubon trying to find a prisoner of war camp. And I'll be honest with you that 95% of the people in Ubon haven't a clue that there was a prisoner of war camp in Ubon. But it so happened that uh, my daughter's uh, son was on, um, was on a bus going to school and he was talking to his friend that um, me, the Farang, was uh, looking around and has found a prisoner of war camp in, um, in, in Ubon. And the lady behind them overheard this conversation and she tapped um, Yo on the shoulder and got my wife's telephone number and therefore got in touch with me. And this lady is called Aura Tai and she's the secretary of a group of Thai professional people um, and, and it's a bit like um, are you do you know the probus clubs in uh, in Britain the, the retired professional people um, you know get together it's like a, a luncheon club really and uh, they, they do good things for charity and all that sort of stuff it's a similar thing in in Thailand and, and this group of there's probably about 30 of them who are uh, teachers lecturers uh, there's a couple of doctors there all retired but they have this you know, kind of social interests and uh, Oritai is secretary of this group and she she uh, cottoned onto this story and wanted to um, wanted to find out more about it and since then she's all, she's helped a tremendous amount of um, by contacting people who old people who still live in Ubon who can remember uh, the, the Japanese camp and um, some of the areas around it you know for example um there was a school a catholic school where the japanese uh, officers uh, had their main office um you see U ubon was not just about a prisoner of war camp it, it was but there was a lot of um japanese garrisons in the area and just to put it into context that at the end of the war um major smiley um, gathered 9,000 Japanese soldiers and, you know, they, they surrendered the two bomb and gave up their arms. So there was a huge amount of um, Japanese infrastructure in, in that area. Um, and, and they used other places, you know, they, they used this school. Um, I was taken to the school and shown the actual building where the Japanese had their office. The university, there's a building there. Um, there was a loop on the railway line where it was um, goods were taken to get onto the river a little bit easier. Small things like this just help to develop the story. Um, finally, um, coming back to the memorial in uh, in Ubon, um, if you remember, said it was dedicated as a, a memorial of merit, and the story is that there's this. It's all. It's almost um, a legend, really, that. There was one particular lady who is called the Little Mother of Ubon, and she gave food to the prisoners who were working down by the river, not on the airstrip, but down by the river. And I, I couldn't work this out because um, the camp and the airstrip, it's, it's nowhere near a river. You know, it, it's miles away. And why would prisoners be working at the river and I, I, I couldn't work this story out but then um, I, I don't know how this happened um, one of the um, in the Kofipo groups is um, a chap there called Mike Clark and his father was a prisoner at, um, at, at Ubon and Mike is still friendly with um, a chap called Tom Brown who, um, who is still alive he's actually 100 next week um, and, and, and Mike put me in touch with Tom. I went to see Tom, lives in Gosport, and um, <clears throat> we got talking. And, and Tom's memory is absolutely fantastic. It's better than mine, you know. He's he's he's, um, I would, he's, he's not a hundred percent fit, but he still looks after himself. And um, you know, his his memory and his his stories are fantastic. Um, talked to him for ages. And he said um, he was in a working party and sent by the Japanese in this uh, um, broke this wagon. The, the sides had dropped off. He said, it's a wonder how it moved. You know, it, it, it moved, but it couldn't stop. You know, that, that type of vehicle. 
and they were sent down to the river to um, unload um, boats uh, because there was no bridge over the river in, in Ubon and the railway was on the other side of the city. So <clears throat> the railway stopped and anything that was required for Ubon had to be ferried across the river, which is pretty wide. You know, it's, it's a huge river. And Tom was in this working party where he was unloading um, the, these small ferries, putting it on the truck and taking it back to the camp. And he said, uh, it was amazing, he said, because when we were down there, this little old lady used to leave us baskets of fruit that um, she couldn't sell in the market. Uh, and some of it was going off a little bit, but we didn't care. You know, it was um, it, it was extra food. So he verified the story and I never mentioned it to him. He, you know, he, he told me. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I was able to develop this a little bit. <clears throat> and um, in fact, since then, I've met the, um, the great grandson of um, little mother Ubon and uh, made that connection there as well. Again, through the, the group of Thai people in Ubon. And um, the monument itself, when I mentioned this to Tom, he didn't know anything about it. And I'd spoken to Morris before and he didn't know anything about it. And uh, some of you may know uh, an ex POW called uh, Harold Pleasance. And sadly he passed away um, in, in May this year. But I spoke to him and he didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> but I came across a book written by a Dutch prisoner called uh, Gideon, Gideon Enns, it's up there somewhere. But the book's in Dutch and uh, I, I was able to find the section on Ubon and I've got the story of how the monument was built because the camp consisted of, um, in rough figures, 1500 British, um, 100 Australians, four Americans and 1500 Dutch. Now the British, uh, Australians and the Americans were um, repatriated quickly. Well, say quickly, it took six weeks, but they, they'd gone. But the Dutch couldn't go back because the majority of them came from Indonesian islands where there was nationalist um, uprisings going on. I mean, that's another story about Zubon, really. Um, the war just didn't end for these guys, you know, they, they, they couldn't go back because it was too dangerous for them. So they had to stay and they, the people of Ubon took them to the hearts and helped them with food, with entertainment, parties and care and so forth. Uh, and, and the Dutch decided to build this, um, this monument to thank them for, for the hospitality. Uh, so it was the Dutch that built it, and uh, the, sto the full story is in the book, including a presentation that they made to the little mother of Ubon at, um, at a party at, um, at, at some point after all the other prisoners had gone. And um, then, just by sheer chance, again, you know, these things happen, don't they, through the wonders of the internet, there was another group about uh, World War II in Burma, which I kind of latched onto. And uh, there was one um, one posting in there that led me to think that, that there might be a connection with Ubon. And it was to an SOE officer called uh, Major Headley, Major John Headley. And I thought, I'm sure I've seen that name somewhere. And it's in um, Smiley's book, Major John Headley. So I contacted the guy who made this posting because Headley had been in Burma and uh, he, he won the military cross for stuff he did in the SRE in, in Burma, but he was, he was injured and taken out. Then when the war was finished, he, he was asked if he would like to go and do some help at, uh, at Ubon, after, you know, to, to sort of um, repatriate the prisoners and get things back to normal. So he did go, and um, I also found a, a rare copy of his uh, book, it's a biography because um, the author of this book found his diary in a jumble sale and um, read it and thought, well, this is fantastic, you know. So he, he, he wrote up the notes and it was published in, a, in book form. And I managed to get hold of the book, which then told the story of what happened to Ubon after the prisoners had left. And uh, that, that's 
you know, we often think the story ends, don't we, once the camp has, has closed down and the, the guys have gone back. But there was a lot of tidying up to do, including 9,000 um, rounding up of Japanese soldiers and disarming them. Um, where where do you keep 9,000 Japanese soldiers? <laughs> <clears throat> That's a big question. And um, I found out it was on the site of the university that was uh, in the process of being built, but the war uh, stopped this construction, so, so they, 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 they went there. Um, and quite a lot of other things, like what do you do with all the uh, 9,000 guns and you know, there must be hundreds of thousands of bullets and armory and bombs and such like and so forth. Um, well, he didn't know what to do with them. So he, he got in touch with his um, his commanding officer who was in Bangkok and he got in touch with the RAF to see if they could use any of it. And uh, they, they said, no, we can't use anything. So in the end, the message got back to um, Major Headley. <clears throat> that the guns should be sent to Bangkok on a special train uh, where they were put onto a landing craft and the landing craft sailed out into the Gulf of Thailand and dumped them in the sea. So that's where all the guns are if you <laughs> want to go looking. But with the uh, the armaments, of, uh, you know, from bullets and <coughs> grenades, shells and all sorts, um, the, it was destroyed locally. So Major Headley was thinking, oh, well, where do I get rid of these? Well, the ideal place in the end was on the airstrip because, and you know, this story is common throughout um, Thai um, prison of war camps, is that the prisoners were asked to dig their own graves. And the same thing happened at uh, Ubon. They dug three trenches across the, the airstrip and um, th that's where they were, you know, going to be buried. But the holes were still there, or the trenches were still there. So Major Headley <clears throat> decided this was the ideal place to destroy the ammunition. And uh, he had a hundred tons of um, armaments to get rid of. And he put, um, <clears throat> excuse me, he put um, a quantity, I just forget the number now, but it was probably about five tons in each trench. Um, and then laid a fuse so that one would go after one would go off after the other, so boom, 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 like that. And um, the, the, it said the explosions could be heard in Ubon, which was nine kilometres away. Uh, but uh, they got rid of all of the ammunition that way, and the and the holes are still there. The craters are, are still there, and it's that ties up that little bit of a story. Sadly, um, if you remember the chap who showed me the airstrip, Tong D. Um, he told the story of um, his friend finding a grenade and picked it up and it exploded and killed him uh, well, whilst they were playing with it. Um, so that, that was a sad story to that one. And um, again, um, sniffing around the airstrip and the, uh, the camp, one day Tong Di took me to um, a, a, an area of the camp that I've not been to, or the, the site of the camp. There's nothing there now. It, it, they grow rice on, on, on the camp, so there's, there's nothing to see. But he took me to um, at this part, uh, this, this little village on the, on the northern end of the camp. And um, the owner of this uh, rice field said, uh, oh, yeah, 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 the Japanese were, were here. He said, uh, and he took me to his rice field. And in, in Thailand, in this part of Thailand, it's very, very flat. So they, they build what I call buns to separate each field. It's really to keep the water in. And um, he built this rather large bund and in the bund was these bricks. And these were bricks made by the prisoners for um, ovens and uh, an incinerator. And um, he, he showed me one and then we started digging around. And in the end, I've got about nearly 40 of these bricks um, back, back at the house in Ubon. Um, all different sizes, <clears throat> you know, obviously the ovens went in a, a dome type shape, so there they was different sizes, Tongan groove in some of them as well. And uh, I was really excited with this. But then, um, and I, I've, I'm coming to the end now, um, they took me back to the village and um, I said, well, if there's any more 
things you found, you know, any coins, any whatever, anything. And this lady came out with a bomb casing. <laughs> um, it, it's about two, two, over two feet high, and it's the back end of a bomb with the uh, with the fins on and everything. And obviously, there's nothing inside it. But um, she'd um, found this in the rice field, and um, it, it was kept in the outhouse for seventy odd years. So. Um, you know, everything has a price, doesn't it? So I offered uh, this lady um, a thousand baht, and she was more than happy to take my money. So I've got I've got that back at home as well. Um, and um, I've got a metal detector, so I've been on the um, the airstrip, and I've got hundreds of uh, fragments of, um, of bombs and uh, shells and so forth from from the area where where this ammunition was destroyed. So. Um, you know, with all of that, they're very, very lucky to be able to go and, and, and stay in these places and get, get the information from that side of the story as well. Um, and also it kept me quiet for five years because <laughs> going over to Thailand is, um, you know, it's great and the weather's perfect and all of that sort of stuff. But you do need to find things to do. <laughs> it's... Um, you know, it, it's been a, and it, it, it's not finished to be honest. You know, they, they found lots of secret airstrips of the Saritai built and uh, places that made a smiley mentions in his book. I've been able to locate and not not in the Ubon area, but in the northeast um, the Thailand area. So uh, you know, there's there's more to do. So there we go. If anybody's any questions, I'd be happy to uh, to answer them. Yeah, that's uh, that's brilliant, really. Just where you're talking there, uh, uh, we're expecting the next book to come out, then, or <laughs> follow up. <laughs> well, um, that's another story, isn't it? Publishing books is um, is not quite as easy as doing the research, to be honest. It's a lot. Well, it's there's expense to it as well. But I, I, I wrote the book really for two or three reasons. One, it the personal reason is that I've always wanted to do something like that, you know, this legacy thing, isn't it? But the, the other thing is that um, there was stories there for people whose fathers and um, uncles, brothers, whatever, were there. But some people didn't even know where Ubon was, never mind what went on there. So I, I think, you know, I've done it for that reason, really, as much as anything, that... Um, that it can, it can add to the to the FIPO story, um, and and yeah, there, there's bits of information. As I say, it, it's dragging all of this together, and you know sometimes you're scratching your head because that bit of information doesn't tie up with that. But then on the other hand, you'd read a report and it said that something like on the 24th of March, a train arrived in Ubon with 500 prisoners on it, and they were marched up to the camp. <clears throat> You know that that's doesn't sound much, but that's that's important information. That um, and, and all these hundreds of little threads you've had together um, make makes a, a full story. So uh, yeah, there, there was. Um, sorry, I, I could go on all day and you'd probably get fed up. But I'll I'll just mention this last one mm -hmm. that um, I interviewed um, a lady whose father was. A, a, a member of parliament for Ubon at the time. And uh, she subsequently became an MP as well. We called uh, assemblymen in Thailand. And um, she remembers as a little girl that um, there was eight Seritai um, men who were killed in an accident and, and they were shot, but she didn't know any more details. And, you know, you can't, that's, like a little bit of a story and you want to know more about it. In Major Headley's book, um, he was there at the time and he he, he went to the funeral of these guys because they were buried very quickly because they didn't want the Japanese to know that the Seritai were, were about in Ubon. So the bodies were, were buried. But after the war, they were exhumed and they were given a full Buddhist funeral. And uh, Major Headley talks about this funeral in uh, in his book mentions the eight uh, seritai so um gorillas in the story and uh, uh, he attended the funeral with you know they were given full 
sort of military honours uh, with the governor and uh, and him there. So it's little things like that, you know, that you get a little snippet here and then dig a bit further and you get more to the story and it's uh, weaving them all together. So, Is there anybody thank you for listening. Want to ask you a real question? Or? Can I, can I just make a comment? <laughs> Ray, I've got your book and it's, it's a super book. And I like the way it's written because you've got no personal connection to this. So what you've done in a very dispassionate way is really look into this history. You've dug beneath the surface and you've made a book that is just brilliant. I think if you're writing a book about your own um, particular FIPO, you tend to concentrate on their story. And, and that sort of gives the book a bit of a bias. But your book is totally unbiased. Mm. It's excellent. I love the way the research has gone. And I, and I think it's a really worthwhile book. And not only that, you, you're now going to make the villagers and, and the townspeople of that area look back and know that um, what happened in World War II in their small area is something they need to remember. And that's mm. a really great thing for us as the descendants of FIPOs, to know mm. that they're going to be remembered. Uh, when I went out mm. to Saigon to look at my dad's um, past, th there was no recollection because the Vietnam War had taken over, yeah. and mm. that's what they remembered. So I'm so pleased with what you've done through this book, Ray, that they're going to be mm. proud, actually, if you can be proud of that area and, and what happened, but they will remember it and pass it down through the generations. So, Thank you, Ray, for what you've done. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you, for, thank you very much, Barbara. That's uh, that's kind words. But yeah, the the Ubon group, um, they have made a, a, a small booklet out of the story um, for the school children of Ubon, and um, I believe I'm, I'm not a hundred percent certain, but they have a every year they have a November the eleventh uh, remembrance service at this Monument of Merit. Because there's, there's a lot of foreigners in the area, um, ex uh, Vietnam, Australian, and American, and also there's a group of British um, um, expats there as well who, who were in the service. And um, this book is going to be released on um, the 11th of November to to Ubon children. So that, that's that's a good thing. And uh, I've made connections with uh, a group of Vietnam veterans and. Also, the Royal Thai Air Force. I've got a very strong connection there as well. And last time I was out there, I mean, the virus has stopped all this sort of thing. But uh, we were talking of having some sort of plaque made um, to, to put somewhere to commemorate actually what, uh, what happened, um, you know, with, with the prisoners. So that, there's things to do still, you know, to, to, for remembrance. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks very much, Ray. Um, I think uh, for the last little bit of the meeting, uh, how about the new members to let me know about uh, your people? Uh, Margaret, would you like to say a few things? Yes, yes. Um, I'm Margaret Wallace. I'm from Durham. And my dad was in the 287 Royal Engineers Field Company um, in the 18th Division. And Dad lived to just a month short of his 96th birthday. And he didn't speak much at all, as is a common thread that we see. Um, but after the 50th anniversary of VJ Day, when and there was more said, little bits of snippets came out. And I wish he was here now, because I know the questions I want to ask him now. Before, it used to be, oh, he's telling his war stories again. And we remembered snippets, we remembered some funny stories that he told and we remembered some sad stories but nothing of the horror and um, my mum said when they were first married that he had nightmares he always had to have the bedroom curtains open he could have a net curtain but not the main curtains drawn across didn't like the dark um when he came home his mum served him rice pudding as was the you know full full sunday dinner and rice pudding to follow um but I've spent the time, I think, from June, I joined the, the Facebook group um, and I really got, got into top gear, I think, um, as it came towards the, the VJ day. So I've spent a couple of months and there's some harrowing stories, but the, the support I've had from the, um, the FIPU has been fantastic. 
and we were lucky enough to go to the Arboretum um, on the Bank Holiday in August. It was just after the celebrations there, but it's absolutely fascinating. It's um, I'm obsessed now. I'm absolutely <laughs> obsessed. <laughs> Good. Yeah, join join the club. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Uh, Jeff, do you like to see a few words? Yeah, that's uh, well, Kevin. Yeah, I'm Jeff Graham, and I'm from Kevin's part of the world up here in Gateshead. Um, that's not the only uh, thing we have in common. Is uh, our fathers were both in the um, same prisoner war camp uh, in uh, Palembang. Um, I think uh, his dad worked in the uh, under Doctor Eden Corcoran. Yeah. In the yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, me, me dad was a, a bit of a character. Um, he was um, the reason I joined the people was to find more about what happened to me dad because he served on board HMS Repulse, which was sank along with the Prince of Wales on December tenth. Um, and it was only from there he only told us that he was picked up uh, in a, by a destroyer and then taken back to uh, Singapore. And I never knew what happened to him then, um, apart from the fact that he mentioned. Uh, the orangutans being the old man of Borneo, and for some reason I always thought <laughs> that's where he was a prisoner of war, on Borneo. And, and through this site and uh, a lot of help that I've received, um, I found out he was uh, evacuated from Singapore, Singapore, Dunk Dunkirk, um, and then captured in the Banker Straits, taken to Montauk Island and uh, ended up in the uh, smart round Palembang. So yeah. He's a queer old my dad, lad. Didn't talk about it much. He, he tended to, like, like Morris said, the funny stories, you know? I mean, I loved it. I loved, he hated race. I loved it. But I thought it was Ambrosia race. <laughs> 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 so, and I couldn't understand why he didn't like race. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. I learned a lot. I'm reading a lot of books at the moment. Um, <clears throat> another story that, that, that came to mind was, uh, <laughs> I'm reading No Bamboo for Coffins. And, like Ray said, he was on a, on a work party um, that went up river, um, and they worked on um, searchlights and ak ak positions. They weren't supposed to, of course. Um, but whenever my dad was uh, in the house working or in the garden, he would sing "Old Man River." And apparently, I wonder if he was on that work party <laughs> because that's a song that they used to sing to, to pass the way yeah. while they were travelling up to work on these states. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks for that. that uh, yeah. It's a good sight. Yeah, great. Right, Stacey. Um, uh, Jackie? Yeah. Um, I suppose my story is very similar to a lot of people's. My father was um, attached to the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers. He was a doctor, um, spent most of his time in Changi, but went up. He was part of F Force. Um, what they call ill fated F Force. Uh, it's thanks to the internet, really, that I've started doing research. I used to do little talks about his um, his experiences because I feel quite strongly that people know a lot about the war in Europe and very, very little about the war in the mm. Far East. And it's only very recently, I think it was last year, somebody told me that they were actually ordered, physically ordered, not to say anything at all about their experiences. And um, I think you all know Louise Reynolds and in her most recent book she actually had um, a little facsimile of the sheet they were given out ordering them not to say anything. So like everyone else I didn't know anything. We were told not to ask my father anything. He was ill a lot. He had recurring bouts of malaria and then my parents went on holiday in the Far East in the 80s and when they came back dad got down his diary and he had <clears throat> enormous really interesting diaries and I started transcribing them and finished them after he died and like I forget who it was who said it but I so wished he was here I could ask him so many questions anyway when lockdown started <coughs> I am um, actually started to put it into um, book form and um, got the book actually published just before VJ Day so I feel I've done something <coughs> excuse me so yeah but thanks to the internet I've met so many people 
and it's really got me going. And uh, yeah, I think there's been quite a quite a bit on the Royal Law Fund of News <laughs> yes, recently. Uh, I, um, quite a lot of uh, posts on uh, on the Facebook family page. Uh, so the, and, and uh, can I say um, I don't know if Jackie went to Carlisle Castle, but they actually did a, a thing within the castle about the Northumberland Fusiliers. I think I told you, Kevin. Um, so we went. We were actually able to have a, a week away. So our thing was to go to Carlisle Castle to see what they'd done on on the uh, FIPOs and uh, their experience. Did you? Were you able to go there? No, I didn't know about that. I have been in Granite Castle where they've got the yeah. well, Northumberland Fusilier Museum, but it's only a small museum. Yeah, very interesting. But I didn't know about Carlisle. I'll have to because uh, I'm in Yorkshire, so. Uh -huh. Sorry, can I just interrupt? Um, I'm going to have to go because I've got a Tesco delivery. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, Ray. Well, hi, Ray. Okay, Ray. Okay, bye. 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 I don't know how to, how to switch off. Yeah, so I will, I will try and get to car. So oh, is that a permanent I, thing? Was it just no, I think it was only, it was only for during the, um, the VJ day. Uh, thing. No. It was just boards outside. But there is actually um, a small exhibit about the World War II um, uh, the, in the Far East with, within their permanent museum, but it is very small. It was, uh, it was all just picture boards that they'd put up telling the story of the Northumberland Fusiliers. You know, I'm glad I went, um, mm. but it wasn't a lot. But any mention of them yeah. is, is, you know, has to be appreciated now, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And we'll get there. We'll get their story out. Yeah. 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 Also uh, the commanding officer who lives in Putney, London. Mm. So, uh -huh. hi, Ke Kevin, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I'm putting on the uh, disembarkments for Thailand, Burma. I'm going over my old ones. Oh yes, yes. They, they, they really wanted updating. Um, interesting case. Uh, that I asked Andrew to look over, Andrew Snow. Oh, yeah. And he came up with two things. Um, one was the trains I had leaving Kuala Lumpur on the 14th of October, 42. There was only one. Yep. The one with 399 POWs did go from Singapore. So, so that's one correction. So they didn't have two trains from Kuala Lumpur. They only had the one, and that was 401 POWs. And the one from Singapore had 399 POWs, which is strange because they normally have 650 or 600 or 650. Oh, yeah. uh, another, another thing he, he, he mentioned, Keith, and this, this one is really, I've never heard of this one before. On the 7th of January, 43, I had a train going from Singapore to Thailand uh, carrying the 3rd, 4th, 5th A, 5th B and 5th C yeah. uh, Java parties. That's right. Okay. Yeah. They didn't actually go to Thailand. They went to Kuala Lumpur. Did he? Yeah, which is very strange. That's the only one I've ever had this that didn't go from Singapore to Thailand. I went to Kuala Lumpur and then they were taken over to Penang where they they got a convoy. And the convoy was the Muji Maru. And the, I, I don't know how you pronounce it, but as, I've got it as Nik, Nikimi, Nikimi Maru, which was sunk on the way to Burma. And uh, that was yeah. that, that had POWs and Japanese soldiers on board. Um, I think it was 97 Japanese soldiers died and 40 Dutch prisoners. Um, I, I haven't got that one. I haven't had that one at all. So that one is completely new to me. Um, to take a train to Kuala Lumpur, then over to Penang seems a bit strange. Wasn't it? Yeah, but on that train, there was only, I think there, there was under a thousand. But in the convoy to Burma, 
There was 2,993. So where the rest of them come from, I don't know. So that, that one is strange. So if you do come across it, Keith, I am looking for the rest of those POWs. Were they in Penang? Were they in Penang and made up the convoy? I don't know. So that one is strange. Okay. I, I just thought I'd, I'd ask you, Keith, if you can keep an eye out for those two. Yeah, I will do. An another one, Keith. Uh, sorry to butt in on the on this, but another one, Keith, is um, uh, the Saigon Battalion. Yeah. When they left, they left Saigon to go to Thailand. Did they take the route across land, or did they go back to si Singapore, then up the railway? Because I can't find anywhere where it tells you. Now the the the. the Sumatra Battalion, when they'd finished on the railway, went across land to Saigon. Now, did did the did the Saigon Battalion do it in the opposite direction? I think they did. I'll check it out and let you know. Yeah, because if they did, that's two trips across land which we hadn't had before. Uh, I'll have a look in Richard Candler's book. Yeah, if you can, if you can just sort that one out. Sure, they okay. signed on to Long Pen and along across to the railway. They went to, yeah, they, if they took the same route as the Sumatra Battalion took in the opposite direction, because they went from the railway to Saigon, they went across land and then across the, what is it called, the river in, Saig in Sa uh, Saigon? begin with W. I, I can't think of it, but anyway, they went across the river, then barged up to Saigon. Okay. Now, if this, I, I want to know if they did it in the opposite direction. Okay, I'll have a look for it. So I haven't got any anything on that at all. Um, yeah, sorry to butt in. No problem, Ronnie. Just hope you have uh, how's your viewing went okay? Yeah, yeah. Do, don't you feel sometimes that they just come round to VU just for something to do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get the impression. I, I think in the end, I mean, it's nothing to do with me, but in the end, I think we are going to rent it. In the end, we'll rent it and then yeah. so we, we can move and move all our furniture over and then give the state agencies doing the letter and give them the key and so we won't be people again. I know, it's it's horrible because afterwards you're going up the banister because they touch the banister you're wiping all the banisters down. Oh, yeah. it, it, it honestly is a pain. Anyway, get on with your meeting. Okay. Sorry. Hello, Bernard. All right. Hi, Bernard. Oh, Lovely to see you. Hey, all right, Bernard. Where's he? Hi, Bernard. Can't hear you. You can't hear us? We can hear you. Yeah. I can't hear Bernard. Oh. That's my stomach. No. No. Yeah. Can you, um, it keeps breaking, freezing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to jump sort of um, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> <laughs> While Bernard still sat out, can I just do a small thing? Um, the other day on one of the Facebook sites, there was a mention of um, the term medics being used. I don't know if any of you saw it. Um, and they were yeah. saying that that wasn't the right term for it to be used. And um, I don't know about you, you know, you, you're saying about how once you get into this things, you know, you, you, it never's out of your mind. It's always there in the back of your head. So I thought, I've come across this term being used by a FIPO. Um, so just this morning, which was probably why I was a bit late joining, I went to find this book, uh, which is a Brummie in Burma. He was a medic, and, and he lived within virtually spitting dif distance of where, where I lived. Um, and, and lo and behold, there you go. Um, he describes, firstly, he's growing up in Birmingham and moving to um, the area not far from where I live. Um, but he said his mother was very concerned when he joined. Um, but a lot of when he enlisted, uh, a lot of them were put into the medical corps, and in brackets, he's actually written medics. 
So I think whoever it was who said was saying that these men should not, you know, if they were in the medical corps, could not be re referred to as medics. But here's one, he's written it in his book, and he refers to himself as a medic. So I think that term is quite accurate. I, I would agree with that, because in my dad's diary, it talks about the medics frequently. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So certainly. I don't know why, why they were saying that that, that didn't apply to them modern term because you know it's in this book and he's written it so i'll go with what he described himself as it seemed a strange thing to post on facebook to me anyway well, as sorry says he was attended by medics and then yeah. transferred to the hospital. yeah so i don't know why they brought that up as being correct no, afterwards. Mm. so yeah sorry it's just a small thing <laughs> medics is a term used i think all over yeah. She says virtue of medical orderly or medical officer. They're just the nurses, it's the people who you know did the medical things. Medi yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think it it's just one of these things that you know, it's never it's always at the back of your mind, you know, about your dad's things, you're listening for things. And in the night I suddenly thought, I've seen it somewhere in this book. So I went and dug it out from all the books and um Refound my one destined meetings, which links into something that Keith and I were talking about, or you know, to do while well, we're we're both on the same committee for FIPOs. And um, two years ago, there was um, at the the Research in FIPO History Conference. There was a chap who did um, um, one of the the um, things as part of the conference on the double tenth, which is always in my mind on the tenth of October, and I included it in my thing. And um, apparently he's now put out a book. Um, but that was the other thing I did today, was to read this destined meeting, which goes into quite grim description of what happened to the people who were tortured by the Kempatai during that. So I'm going to be looking into that. I yeah. hope that, Keith, you can send me the details of this gentleman's book so I can buy it. Yeah, yeah when, I, when I was doing that, Barbara, I, I was putting a piece on a couple of weeks ago and mm -hmm. uh, and the delay in the Singapore commander, Japanese commander, let you know, recognizing the recognizing the surrender, was that he wanted to clear up the atrocities, and yeah. the double tenth was one, and the crewmen who were on the submarine with the double tenth is all about, yeah, crewmen who were on the submarine. There was ten of them were beheaded just before the surrender. Yes. Ten of them were beheaded just before the surrender. But I didn't I didn't realise that. And he 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 actually they were buried and he uh, they were dug up and um, they were dug up and um, put on the fire. Mm. Uh, well it was you know a really, really grim episode you know in, in the history out there i mean it's dr stanley that i'm referring to and when you read um the horrors that he had inflicted upon him and that you know the the book i've got is the story of, of the lady um that was also imprisoned at that time and uh, i say i sat this morning before i came on and reread some of that and and it horrifies you it gives me the shudders as to what they were subjected to but, um, yeah, so double tenth yesterday and, um, you know, let's remember, you know, what awful things happened to them. And, you know, I'm pleased that um, Dr. Stanley's son has now managed to publish his book and I look forward to uh, getting a copy. I was really pleased to, to meet him um, on the evening after he'd um, done his piece on it at the conference. And um, he was very emotional. The things that he told me that he hadn't brought up during the conference, I presume, will be in the book. Um, and um, I, I can't say I look forward to reading it because it will be grim. Um, but it's good to know these things. And um, I think that um, when, when, you f when you finish looking at what your dad's history is and then you move on to other things and you finally come to the end of the war and you look at the, um, the war crimes, you realise how much we still really need to recognise as part of that, that history of World War II in the Far East. Because it's um, yeah, sorry, I should get emotional. <laughs> yeah, sorry, about, I'll shut up. I was going to say, talking about the uh, the, the doctors, uh, as I say, I've made that all the admiration for them for the work that they did. But uh, 
Jeff made the, uh, I've talked to him in the email Jeff about this. I've got, we've got a, a document about the uh, the doctor in our dad's prisoner of war camp. And by the mm. end of the war, the year was starting to go herself. The, the doctors were starting to really suffer themselves. And uh, mm. it seemed like they sent out a, a message saying we urgently need somebody to come and relieve her because the doctors are, are, are on the verge of collapsing herself. So the, the the work they did was uh, absolutely tremendous, tremendous. Yeah. <coughs> well, going back nice. to Ray and Ubon, um, I was <laughs> amazed when um, uh, I visited or was fortunate enough to, to visit the researching history um, exhibition at the Victoria Gallery and Museum. And um, I, I saw the two pictures there of the Ubon camp, but I thought Ray had perhaps, you know, that you'd put them there, Ray, but you said it wasn't um, from no. yourself. And they were interesting to see um, the Ubon camp there mm. in the artwork, you know. Mm. It was, uh, they jumped out at me, so, well, I was going to be Ray's. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like we see, Bob, right? it's uh, something gets brought up in meetings or on the Facebook post and you, it, it immediately re leaps out at you. It's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Before, you could, uh, you, you, you would have just like, skimmed over that. You wouldn't have thought about it, but now we, we know yeah. about these things, and it, it, it it's amazing how these things just leap out at you. Yeah. Well, what well, well, I found good about uh, Ray's book, and he knows that because I told him, is the fact that unlike a lot of um, books, um, <clears throat> he didn't just like like uh, Barbara said earlier. He was, if you like. Um, he managed to paint a picture without actually being personally involved in that mm. and to surround it, to support it, he actually, which I found really, really refreshing was he then also incorporated what was going on around, not just the prison war camp, but around Ubon and the area by the Tai and all the rest of it and how they uh, how they worked and done things and that I found very interesting because a lot of like like Barbara said a lot of stories are based on personal experience or just a relative or a certain group of people or a certain POW camp and not the surroundings you hear you, know, you read bits always oh, had the dealings of the locals who managed to buy food Ray went a bit further and like the, uh, uh, the Lady of Ubon and a lot of different people, you managed to bring it all in. So you've got a, a better, I found it a really interesting and wanted me, it made me want to know more, um, picture of what went on. Mm. Uh, I, I've tried to think and I can't think of a book on the World War Two FIFA experiences that instead of dealing with the, if you like, the horrors of the, the camp, which is well known, and they, they are mentioned, what went on in it, but um, I can't think of another book that did that for me anyway. So like I said to Ray, come on to go, well done. Well done, I enjoyed that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you. Done. I, I, I've just spent um, the last week in, uh, in France visiting a friend, um, that's why I'm in 14 days quarantine now and uh, Pesco just uh, arrived to keep me going. Um, I got back last night, but um, this friend of mine is the stepsister of Noel Barber, who um, wrote Sinister Twilight and uh, yeah. uh, Tanamera and all those sort of things. And um, when, when she was very quite close to, to Noel and Noel wrote quite a number of books um, in during the Second World War, connected with Southeast Asia. And she's lent this one to me. I don't know if you've ever seen it before. Um, How Strong is Japan? Well, no. And, yeah, and well. It, it was written in um, 1940, in January 1942. So there are early references to um, Pearl Harbor and... Uh, Prince of Wales and all that sort of stuff, but it is, I've not read it yet, so I'm quite interested in, uh, in in finding out. 
just if it adds any more detail to um, you know to, to, to the story of uh, the Japanese invasion of um, Southeast Asia. Like once, but I know I've read. Um, I think it's two of No Bother's books. I can't quite think of them. Out of the and uh, just as a bit of an interesting sideline, um, my friend Jane has got lots of friends in this uh, tiny French village near. It's in Bergerac near near Bordeaux. Um, yeah. And um, one of the friends is an ex SAS soldier. Uh, he's 86 now, so he, he goes back. Um, he, he was uh, really involved with the Cold War and so forth. But um, he, he, he told some stories, you know, and the, 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 the old boy, boy with dolls, although they are interesting. But what his wife did say is that he, he still has nightmares. And. Um, once or twice he's woken up in the night with his hands around her neck and um, he, at, at some time um not now but sometime before he used to sleep with a knife under the pillow <laughs> and it, so you know the, the, this ptsd thing it's it's been around for such a long time hasn't it that uh, um yeah. i mean he, he's okay with it now i suppose but um i found that fascinating no. Yeah. No. Oh, I think. I mean, it wasn't recognised as such. I mean, my father suffered from malaria and God knows what for many, well, for all his life actually. But he used to have nightmares and she tried killing me and my sister and my, my mother on various occasions in the night. He got so depressed. Um, but he managed he, 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 he was a, he was a great dad those, those were early days when we were still babies and he didn't think with what was going on in the world we should, we should he wanted to live all that we should go through uh things he was a bit disturbed at the time uh, but, i mean i know for myself you have uh, you have ptsd and flashbacks that can be quite debilitating, probably, maybe like him today. But um, <clears throat> it's an unknown, it's, and no matter how I say, go into it and say, give it names like PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder, and all the rest of it. Or in the first world war, it was um, lack of moral fiber, really. <laughs> uh, it, 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 and we, we forget that there's also, it's not an excuse, but it also explains a lot why um, different soldiers in different countries, of different Japanese, German, Korean, whatever you want to call them, American, Australian, all suffered in various forms, even while they were serving of that particular disease. Um, I mean, my father was made deaf. He got smashed hands and holes through his legs and God knows what. But that, he had to continue. I mean, there's no, oh, go back to the hospital and go home. It was, yeah, you, know, he, he, you wounded, get to hospital. A week, four days, maybe two weeks, you were looking and straight back out. That was maybe because of where they were and where they're fighting. And maybe a lot of others had a chance to recover. But there are many, many that basically were sticking plaster. There you go. Get back there. We need you. And people, to, I mean, people who were, when the Victoria Cross and they say, yeah, he's a magnificent man. He kept on going. And even when he was shot, he kept on. Even these people, yes, they were brave, but also some of them were completely out of their mind in that particular moment. They couldn't take the noise, they couldn't take the stress, you just wanted to get it over with, no matter what it takes. And bullets couldn't hurt them, because that's the way they felt. Um, yeah, I've been shot at yeah, Matt, Matt, my, yeah, my, my dad, what I can remember when I was young, I mean, I was born 47, uh, January 47, so I was, you know, I was quite after the war. Um, I can remember screams in the night and I can remember mm. going through to see 
where the screams were coming from, um, he used to walk the floor. So after the scream, yeah. I could hear him walk on the floor. And when I went in to see him, he used to lay on the floor. He didn't like yeah. the bed. Yeah. He didn't like the bed, so he used to yeah. lay on the floor. Um, until He didn't really tell me much until he gave me his diary in the 1960s uh, to read. But um, when mum died and he came to live with us, he actually talked more about it when he was near 80. And he did actually go through quite a bit with me. Um, but when he was at home, I gave him a tape recorder, which I've still got the tape, a cassette. And I said, whenever you want to think about it, just talk on the, on the cassette. And that's what he did. And I've still got the cassette. It's, um, it's, some of it is personal, but a lot of it is, you know, is, is quite... I think you it was Ronnie, that um, <laughs> I could talk about, even if it's turned to a tape recorder, but probably helped him. I don't know my yeah, I think it did. Yeah, would never ever. He would never. He was didn't join the Burma Star. Wouldn't go to any. He went to a, a remembrance dinner once uh, in the sixties and came back. Um, he said, "I'll never again." He'd never again because he he didn't want to celebrate. He thought there's no reason for him to celebrate war or what they went through. He just wanted to forget it and get on. And of course, his nightmares wouldn't let him. So he never spoke about it. It wasn't till, like I told you, it wasn't until he died and his last few weeks when his memory was, well, the morphine was just making him, bringing these nightmares out to, and he was rambling around him. Because uh, before, his nightmares, he, he couldn't really tell and he'd never say what they were about. And that's what made me decide to find out what he'd done and what he'd been through because we didn't know. My mom didn't know. The only person who did know was my uncle and he died many years um, previously. My dad's brother, because he'd been um, Pete Powell all the rest of him gone through. Well, he came back, he never spoke about anything, but he was so, I would say, mentally and physically. Anyway. Hi Keith. Hi Keith. Hi Keith. Dad, dad, uh, didn't, uh, dad didn't really talk about it at all. <coughs> um, he wouldn't talk about it when I was young. Um, but he didn't hide the fact he was a Japanese POW. But he wouldn't go to any of the adult get-togethers reunions he wouldn't go to any of them he used to take me to st george's park in yarmouth for the annual 11th 11th he used to take me to that um yeah. but, but he, he, he got so involved with the the, the christmas parties for the children and yeah. the feebles honestly they used to give us such good parties they knew how to entertain kids and, and they really were good parties. Um, and a lot of the games they played were the games they played actually in the camps. Um, because they, they did, I mean, there's comradeship in the camps. It wasn't all doom and gloom. Oh. They, did, they did get together and they did have games and stuff. They, they did, they, you know, the people get the wrong impression of it. It wasn't all doom and gloom. Comradeship played a hell of a good part in it. And, um, our, all our Christmases when I was young were spent around my Uncle Jack's, who was a POW with my dad in the same camps. And um, they never talked about it. I never heard them once talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really know they, about it until um, I suppose I was about 13. And then one of these rifle clubs, shooting clubs I was a member of, one of the members, uh, Frank Parkinson, I think his name was, was an ex um, VPAL, and he used to talk to me and tell me things. He worked in a uh, steel foundry in Japan. I can't remember the name now, which name it was. I mean, he died in 1970, 
five, I think. He'd been, he got, he had, only had one foot and uh, half, a, half a hand and different things. And he used to say things like, you know, be careful if you displease anybody, they just push you into the old metal and all the rest of it. And I thought, well, I don't know anything about this, really. So I did ask my father, and he would say, you know, I had to pay no attention to him. That's that's uh, that's his story. I know nothing about it. And that's all he would say about it. Yeah. And uh, I think that happened a lot. And a lot of people didn't speak, and not they were told not to speak about it. Yeah. You know, when you return okay. home, tell your friends. Can I, can I ask though, Bernard? Bernard, you, you you're in a different situation to us because you you were born before your dad went off. Is that okay, Bernard? How did you feel about your dad coming back? I don't think we got his mic. All right. Not here, Bernard, at all. No, because Bernard was uh, obviously born before the war. I don't know if you can hear me, Bernard. Um, and your dad, for those new members, oh, is Margaret gone? Um, you know, Geoffrey may not know that Bernard's dad was the um, the, the gentleman who made the uh, Changi Cross, which I came across this morning, the book about that. Um, but obviously Bernard um, is different in that his dad came back after the war where Bernard was a, was a child and um, so... Uh, Bernard's situation was different. My my own situation with my dad was that um, I thought he'd fought in Europe and, and only Europe because every time um, you know he he got new books from the library because it was traditional then to get all your books from the library. They were all about Europe. All his friends had fought in Europe, so I just thought my dad had, was, had fought in Europe, um, and it was quite a shock when I sort of realised that my dad was sort of one on his own in his group of friends, um, that he'd actually been out in the Far East. Um, but Bernard's story would be slightly different to ours because um, he was born before his dad went off to the Far East. I mean, a lot of children found it very difficult to cope. Um, you know, the excellent book, Stranger at the Door, you know, tells the story of many of these families where, where the prisoners came back and um, the children were quite... Um, you know, put out of place by their return. Bernard, are you able to tell us how you found it? Oh, no. Oh, just, something you'll have to tell us um, next I, time, was, next uh, time, Bernard. And uh, he, I remember, well, my mum remembers. I'm going to say goodbye to you all as well, actually, because the uh, time's um, going on. Anyway, okay, see so you all again soon. Thank you for a good bye, bye, bye. Bye. He doesn't remember his father at all when he was born, uh, except for some strange man. And when his father came back in '46, um, he refused to accept him. And he said he was a nasty, horrible man. And he was, actually, to be honest. He did whatever it happened, whatever we never knew. But he, he totally changed. And he used to beat up uh, my cousin and his sister. My sister left home and eventually committed suicide because um, uh, Bill was, he had problems, anger problems and violent tendencies. And uh, so <clears throat> I don't know, things go, things right, change, yeah. people change, people. Take, right, bye. Hey. Anyway, I'm going to go into it myself now, so you take care. Yeah, good to see you all Thanks again. Again, Matt. Take care of yourself. And Bye, Matt. Get your microphone sorted. Um, <laughs> yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you, Kevin, Timothy. So, yeah, Bernard, for you, mate. Get, get it. Get it. <laughs> see you. All all right. Right. See you, Matt. Yeah. Bye. So Tim is uh, Tim is your connection any better? I don't know. Uh, Tim, no, I don't think so. I'm going to have to do something about it. I think um, it, it works fine. I've got a. There seems to be this delay, but I can hear everyone perfectly, so I'm quite happy. Yeah, that, that's good. I mean, that's the main thing, if you can hear what's going on. I notice your picture keeps freezing up every now and again, like, but, uh, 
But uh, if you can hear, that's the best thing, really, isn't it? Uh, what's been said. Well, Jeff, did you enjoy yeah. that meeting, or? Yeah, yeah, it's good, Kevin. Thanks very much. Yeah, right. enjoyed right. it. I like listening to people's right. stories. Oh, yeah. I think, I think oh, it's, it's, a, it's a data transfer problem. Yeah, yeah. So I look forward to the next one. <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be a, a month. We normally do them. We'll do them once a month on a Sunday, <laughs> if that's okay with yeah. anybody. Yeah, there, there has been talk about this, um, like a lockdown chat. Uh, which not going to be recorded or anything. It would be um, would be uh, just, anyway, just a general chat. Now, you know, so. So. Okay, then we'll yeah. see you. Bye. See you, Tim. <laughs>